now. So uh, welcome everyone. And I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. So um, this is what I was talking about. So if you go to vanderbilt.lt slash pi, the normal landing page, and then go down here to the, the Azure project link and click on that, then this is the notebook for today's lesson. And I'm going to just go ahead and say clone. And see how it says copy to here? That's because I've already done it several times, but whatever. We don't really care. If you just go ahead and say clone, now you can click on this and you have the notebook if you want to work along with the stuff that, uh, that Sanjay is doing. So I, I'm going to stop sharing my screen then and go ahead and turn it over to Sanjay to uh, start the lesson. So uh, before we start, uh, I really appreciate all of you staying um, until this third class. I think I can take it as uh, a testament that at least I haven't bored you to death so far that you are more worried, you're less worried about me and uh, not as much worried about uh, COVID-19, which is raising out there. I hope everybody is staying safe um, and uh, having uh, fun doing whatever. There was a small announcement, not that it matters, but the announcement is that when I started, I had a postdoc position. Uh, at this point, uh, starting last Monday, I'm a staff scientist uh, at the Vanderbilt uh, Ingram Cancer Center. And uh, that had brought some super exciting stuff that I'm doing. And as it turns out that my project had to uh, do with the helping in to build this uh, nationwide in the first and then eventually an international registry of cancers. Um, but now, as it turned out, that uh, COVID-19 had come along, and it is a special challenge for the patients who are into cancer because they are already immunocompromised. And so now we are building up this big registry of uh, cancer in uh, COVID-19 called CCC3. And so I'm a staff scientist and project manager for that. And so maybe it's possible that given that I'm buried knee deep into that, it might reflect into the quality going forward because uh, it's getting hard to uh, manage a project that is runs into a hundred different institutions and a lot of IRBs and data sharing agreements to be signed and whatnot. Well, congratulations. And we really appreciate you taking your time. By the way, Sanjay's not getting paid for doing this. He's doing this out of the goodness of his heart. So thanks. Oh, no. I mean, this is this is one part. I, I really, uh, this, this is the reason why uh, I would have gotten into doing anything. So um, I, Anyway, so let's start with that. Um, the, the first thing, and, and this is unfortunate aspect of doing this class uh, or the approach of this, where the goal is to give you something that you can actually take home and be able to use it right away. So there's gonna be some back and forth. I hate it. Uh, I, I hate starting something from giving you things that you may not immediately need. But the bad part is we are not dealing with the nitty gritty of how the core Python operates. So there is a little bit back and forth. And one of them is that I did not talk so much about the NumPy library. So if you look at here today, the first thing, what are we doing today? The goal today is to be able to take some rudimentary curve fitting. Um, and as some of you already know, the curve fitting sometimes gets confused between the regression. But I want to make it clear, the goal here is to fit the curve and not regression. Now you would ask, what's the difference? The difference is in the curve fitting, we already know what the mathematical function we need our data to define. We have some understanding that we have one variable which is leading into a linear fashion to the other one. We already had the data and we want to tell how good that fit is. The regression is where we don't know that. We still don't know what the model is. We know the data. We might have some intuitiveness about it, but we don't know what the model is. And we give the data and we regress it. And by regression, it tells you that this is the function which is defining it. So in one sense, there is sometimes there's a confusion between those two things. But I want to make sure that we understand what I'm trying to approach here is the curve fitting and not a regression. Regression requires a much more encompassing, much bigger session. So we don't have time for that. Regression is, in one sense, is a special case of curve fitting. But sometimes you might have a situation where you have no curve to fit. ANOVA is a good example. It's a multivariable situation 
and we don't have a curb to fit because there's nothing that visually describes it. Um, so what we're going to do is that we're going to import some libraries that we haven't used as much in the past. And the first one is here is the NumPy. Uh, you are already familiar with the PyPlot. We will do that as we have always done. So matplotlib uh, will be imported as this alias PLP. Then we're going to go to the pandas because we are dealing with data. And we will have an unfortunately, I have twice this, so it doesn't need to be imported twice, so that's not needed. And then we'll also employ this thing called scientific Python. So that's a separate library, NumPy and SciPy. These are the two core libraries that you in sciences would use a lot. So from SciPy, we will also import the curve fit. Once we have all these libraries, and at the end, we have this standard matplotlib inline, which makes sure that our curves, our plots are visible in the notebook. So we do that and we run it. And I'm sure you can, I would highly recommend if you haven't done it, do download the, 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 the notebook as available on the Azure, because today is a slightly more complicated than what we have done in the past. Now, what is a curve fit? As I said first, you need to know what your curve is to fit it. So the simplest curve that you can fit and linear line is a curve. So we're gonna start with this linear function, which is very familiar, most of you would recall it. It's very straightforward. It's y equal the slope times the x plus whatever the y intercept is. Unfortunately, I don't have a visual here, but you will see the visual coming up pretty soon. You also remember from the first session where we had defined a function. So what we're going to do is we're going to define a function using this equation, line underscore fit, and there are gonna be three inputs that will go to it. There will be an x input, there will be an A input, and then there would be a B input. And that input basically here, A is the slope, which I should have actually written it down. So A is the slope, and then B is the intercept for the Y axis. And from there, we feed these things, and what we want this function to return us a value, which is the A times X plus B. So we activate that, and you can see the return of there. So let's say that we give it, uh, we have a line fit, we want to give it a value, say uh, x equal to two, uh, slope equal one, and intercept as two. And you will expect this to return a value, which is four. So this is functioning, this is working. Now what we're gonna do is, and, and, and the reason why I'm doing it is before we go to an actual fit, I want you to see what is going on and like get some synthetic data, fit it, and then deal with the real life data because the unfortunate aspect of the real life data is as it happens, oftentimes it's noisier and difficult to comprehend. So it is easier to simulate the data, understand what is going on, and then go to a real life data. So what we're gonna do is that now we're going to define a random set of numbers. And that number is gonna be my test X. And what I'm using is, I'm using this uh, NumPy function, NumPy method called lin space. And what it does is that it's gonna take the value, say in this case, it will start with a number zero, go until 10, and in between zero to 10, it will space them by 11 total number. Remember, Python is a zero index number, is a zero index system. So between zero to 10, there are total 11 numbers. One to 10, 10, and then the first one zero. And so when we do that, you can see the value X generates. This is the distribution. So we got, as we said, from zero to 10, equally spaced 11 numbers. Had we done this, say 22, I suppose, you would have gotten the decimals. Here we are. Now, of course, I want to keep it simple, so we will stick with 11, and so we get that. So what we will do is that we will use this thing, and then we will have a same thing. We fed this value. Now, what is interesting here, if you notice, the the function has taken, in the beginning, when we gave line fit 212, it took the value two as an input and it applied the equation to that and returned you a four. But now, because we have given it an array, which has these 11 points, the function returns it 11 different outputs. It took that function, applied that function to individual elements of that and returned you the equivalent value for each one of them. So. If we had it, uh, I think the equation, I should go back to the way it was written. So here, if we do this, if we return this, so now in this case, it's two times, it's 
one times two and plus the value is two. If we return this, it gives you the respectable, the comparable value for that. Uh, probably not uh, whatever is there. Anyway, so now using this function, what we're gonna do is that we're gonna generate some test data. And how we're gonna do it, it's exactly the same. This time I'm gonna have a much bigger set so you can see it clearly. So we're gonna go from zero to five, equally space them by 50. So that's gonna be my X. And the Y would be, I will feed this, the line to that with these functions. So we'll have a two and four X added. Each of these 50 points will be fed to that. And then once we have gotten, I will simulate it by creating some noise. So it looks not a line, but some dirty looking data. And what I'm doing is that I'm using this randomization seed. 1729 just happens to be one of them. You can choose 42. If you remember the Hitchhiker's Galaxy, uh, the, the value of life is, the essence of the life is 42. You can do whatever. Just make sure whatever you do, you stick to that. So every time you get the random numbers, you get the same random structure. And then we will add a little noise to that by taking this random number and we'll add just 0.8 multiplied. So because we don't know what the random numbers are, on that 0.8 multiplied is gonna be even more random. And now we have a number, which is the Y data added with the noise. And so let's do that. Now we're gonna plot it. So what we're gonna do is that we're gonna plot two of these things. Remember the matplotlib structure. We have the X, so we call the, remember we have called the matplotlib.pyplot by its alias PLT. So we have the PLT, we plot it the X data and the Y data, and we're gonna have these circles, which is what the zero is, and R is the red. So we're gonna give them red circles, and we give it a label called noisy data. And then we'll also label our X axis, we'll also label our Y axis, and we'll make sure the legends are there, and then the last one is more of a habit. You don't have to if you have the percentage matplotlib in line, it will show up nevertheless. But I do that as a habit, just so in case you are using this script somewhere into classic Python library, Python script, then it wouldn't work. And the last thing I do is that I do this colon. If you don't do this colon, and I will show that later, if you don't have this colon, what would happen is, that there would be a little annoying matplotlib script, which is what it did, where it stored, you really have no use for it. So I suppress it by having a colon. So now let's run it. And here is a plot. We get this plot. As you see here, that's a noisy data. And the label is here is noisy data. And you can do other things with that. Uh, I, I, I hope that the last class was somewhat instructive enough to help you to start making your plots. And if you have a plot and you run into a problem, feel free to reach to me and I, I can work on them. So, so I, have, have this. Yes. I, I have a question. So for reproducibility and testing, you're using a fixed seed. Is there a way to like have it seed from the clock or something so that it's different every time? Um, I am sure there are those approaches being used the problem is that there is nothing like a random data. At this point, whatever we call random and people whose life matters on it, especially like those who do in the credit card transactions, they worry about it. Uh, in the computational world, there is no perfect randomization. Uh, it's random enough, but it's still predictable enough. So the choice is, it's, I mean, if you do it, you will see the numbers come differently. But if you do them a million times, they begin to have that Gaussian distribution and it's, uh, I would not necessarily worry so much about it unless you are a financial transaction or something. Sticking so, to a seed helps. So e even if you use the same seed, if you run the cell over and over again. Oh yeah, I mean, if, if I did okay. this and if I run it, so I don't know if you can remember it, but if you do this, uh, you will come up a slightly different. It will still be more or less. And I think there is a beautiful visualization somewhere where people have run it. The benefit of that is that by keeping the seed, your range of distribution still stays within that understandability so I and you and everybody else who's doing these things can still have the similar Gaussian distribution. It doesn't matter for this kind of thing, but if you're doing a big data set, it begins to matter. The reproducibility is, uh, this is the key here. If everybody is using a different key, uh, their statistical inference might be different from each other and then you run into this trouble that, well, what the problem is. So, uh, but there are, there is a, that's, that's a whole set of can of worms that um, we can dabble some other time between me and you. So now, like I said, remember I told you, what the curve fit requires, it requires a function. We need to tell upfront what function we are trying to test. 
And then we give it the X data and we give it a Y data. And with that, we generate these coefficient, which is A and B. And those are the, uh, the coefficient of the fit, which is, I said, the slope in this case and the intercept. And then you also get an estimated covariance, which is like how your fit is being distributed around those lines. So now, remember we had the line fit function. So in this case, because we knew this data is coming from linear function or linear function that we generated because the noise is generated by us and we want to fit it to the linear data. So now we, the, the NumPy library the curve fit function that I had, which you will recall down here, uh, scipy.optimize import curve fit. We're using that curve fit and into that curve fit, we are giving it the line fit function. And this is gonna be a standard structure so long as you're sticking with that curve fit structure. We will give it our function. We'll tell what our data is, X and Y data. And it will give you a matrix. It will give you an optimization coefficients of A and B matrix, and will give you a, the covariance matrix. And we can print it. So we do this and here it comes. Remember, in our case, because we knew what data constraints we are putting because our constraints were down here, two and four. So the numbers that we're gonna get here, if this thing had worked, should be closer to two and four. And that's what we get. We get very close to two and we get kind of close to four. Because remember, this was a noisy data. So we didn't have the actual data. These are your A's and B's. And then you have a covariant matrix, which is four of these. So we got that. Um, I, I, I think for the benefit of time, I'll stick away from the major descriptions of these things. But the point is that once we have that, we can get the standard deviation from that. And the standard deviation is just simply the covariance matrix down here, the first one, and then the second one, it's basically the square root of that. So if you ever want to know the standard deviation, all you have to do is you just take these values. So your A value is the first one, which is 2.8 which is the 2.0. And then from there, you have the covariance of this square rooted. So from here, we can just print our matrix. And now we have the value of A plus minus this and the B, which is this 3.89 and the square root of plus minus of that. Now we can plot it. So go back to that. We have now two plots. The first was the raw data plot. So we had the raw data plot with this label and then it's the data that we generated for the X, we didn't do anything. It's the Y that we have predicted because the Y hat is what we're doing. So we feed that with its covariance matrix and then we give it a black color and we call it label. And when we run this, you will notice we get a decent fit, which should not be surprising because well, we knew what the outcome was. But that's the basic crux of the matter here is, this is how we are, um, this is how we fit a curve. So I will kind of pause here and let it, let this sink in. And I will, uh, if somebody have a question here, we can uh, unmute everybody and then uh, go back and uh, uh, let, let there be a discussion if there's a needed discussion. Feel free to unmute yourself if you have a question. Any question? Okay, it looks like it's clear. So this was linear. Now, in following an exact same way, we will follow something else. We will do a non-linear data. So going back to it, remember I said that we're gonna have a randomization. So this time, let's choose another seed. And the reason I'm doing it, not sticking with the same seed is just so you know, you can choose whatever seeding you want. So we will have a np.random seed. And now we're gonna have a similarly, we'll distribute it from zero to 10. And this time we will have a numeric distribution 40. So we will have 40 numeric, not functional, not, not those numbers. So we will have 40 of those. And now we're gonna apply a sinusoidal function to it. Exactly, we did before, we have a Y multiplied by sine, and then now we randomize it by that function. So, and now we will plot it. It should look your favorite familiar sinusoidal curve with the noise, of course. So we got this data. We have this noisy function. Now, again, since this is a curve fit, we ought to know what the fit curve is gonna look like. We need to know that. This, in this case, we, have, we don't have the liberty. Of course, we can have some kind of a polynomial uh, distribution fit, which we can try it, but 
let's say that, let's stick with this, that we need, we know that this is a sinusoidal function. So we will generate a sine fit function just the way we did for linear fit. Again, we define the sine function. We will have it X and we will have it A and B. The difference in this case is what is being returned. What we're returning is now the A multiplied by the sine of B multiplied by its X. So that's our function. And now we're gonna do the same thing what we did. We will pass that function along with its X and Y to the curve fit and that will give us the two values, the parameter array and the covariance array. So we do that, we got that, and now we can print those two functions. We need them to plot our goodness of fit. We got the A value here, we got the B value here, and again, for standard deviation, if we need to do it, we have these two values. And from there, we can generate a hack, Y hack, if you wanna call it. I'm calling here an answer, you can call it whatever you want. Again, going back to it, we're going to take the param. In this case, we, I don't want to call it A and B because that's not what you normally call. This matrix, we need the first value, which is the 3.55, and then the next value, which is 1.32. We will feed that to that, and then from there, we'll generate the so-called Y hats. And these are our predictions from the model that we have. So we have the prediction, and we can just plot it. And I'll come back to this plotting function. There are some interesting things that probably it's a good. And as you can see here, this is our black dotted line that fits pretty reasonably. Again, not surprising because we knew the data. The one thing I want you to, and this is something that I might like to cover in the last one, um, for, for when you do a lot of these plots, oftentimes it is a tedium from the classic approaches to have these, uh, the LaTeX or the, the so-called Greek symbols added and whatnot, especially if you're doing it onto uh, some of the standard uh, plotting routines. And this is where Python outshines everything else. All you had to do is that you enter your LaTeX. So in this case, because I wanted the theta, what I have done is that you do, in the normal label, if you were to have this label, say, um, if you wanted to call it just theta as it is, you will just say theta. And if you do this, it will just say you the word theta. But if you want it to be a LaTeX, what you do is that you, whatever you want the LaTeX to be used, you put that under these uh, dollar strings, and then you need to know what, how, to, how to spell them. And there, is a, there are some good resources of the LaTeX. You can start learning or you can just go back to them. Overleaf is a very good one. And then if you just enter that within that string R, so this is the, this is the crux here, it is, this is needed now extra. Once you do that, you put them into the LaTeX and then if you run it, that theta word will now be actually a theta symbol. So this comes very handy. And you can also have a lot of control on how you want these fonts to look like. If you notice here, I had changed the alpha here. So if I remove this thing from here, these plot, these graphs, these points would look very dark. Sometimes it's not the most interesting way to look at. You can see that they outshine. If that's what you like, that's good. I like them faded out. So what we do is that we give a value of alpha 0 0.5 to one. One is the max, um, zero would be the least and they would not be visible. And you can have a very quick control. So R, if I change R to B, it will be the blue graphs. And this is where, this is where I, this is where if you are not using Python to make your graph, I think it's about time you should start practicing on it because it's very, very handy. So the fact that um, it knows how to interpret that as LaTeX is because it's something that's included in the PLT uh, yes. map plot. So like yes. a, a vanilla Python installation would have no idea how to interpret the dollar signs. But because it's the matplotlib. It, it's the matplotlib. And yeah. sometimes if you're trying to export it as a PDF, you need to do some little extra work. And there is a basic LaTeX functionality. And then there's a whole lot of LaTeX, LaTeX functionality. Now, uh, for certain things, you don't need to install a LaTeX interpreter. For bigger stuff, you need to have a LaTeX interpreter installed. And when you have installed it, it will be available in the path. And then um, when you call for those things, it will go there, use it, and then give you an output. And uh, that might be a thing that you might need. But uh, plot usually takes reasonable amount of LaTeX built in. So, We've already done the sinusoidal function. We already done the linear. Uh, you will wonder why do I want to do another one on the exponential, but I'll do it nevertheless, just for the rigorous sense and just for repeat. So 
do exactly the same thing. We have, uh, we generate an array uh, from zero to one distributed over 40, and we generate the exponential data exactly the way we have done the rest of them. And we can plot them. So we plot it, looks uh, an exponential curve, and then we do the same one here. Uh, we will define our fitting function, which is this fitting function. We fit the data and we will print it. So this is just the reason I'm giving you all three of them because those are the three I think. And uh, if you don't want to invest too much time on trying to define your own function, I think these should take you some away. This would not be a perfect solution. Uh, unfortunately, curve fitting is definitely tedious. It is complicated and not everything works the way you want. Uh, you might need to dig more deep into it, but I think it's still good to know what basically goes under the hood and have something ready for you to be trying. Now, like I said, the real life data tends to be noisy and uh, we will try to do some uh, data. I didn't know exactly which is the best data sets to use, but fortunately there are some very good data structures that are out there. And so uh, this is one of the repositories of a lot of the good quality data uh, called Quantitative Environmental Learning Project. And they have a lot of data. If you don't want to get your own data, uh, you can start with something that is already available. So I thought this would be a good source. This is an interesting data set. These are these uh, clamshells that were collected by high schoolers, I suppose, uh, in, in the West Coast. Um, I think, Steve, probably you might know something about these uh, butter clams. You know anything about them? No. Okay, so these are butter clams, and apparently the idea is that they, depending on what age they are gathered, there is a relationship between their length and width. And from there, uh, they wanted to show that uh, the effect of environment and how the ocean is going, and I would not go into the deeper detail of that. For me, the value was in this open source data. So I am using that data. So we're gonna use that data. Uh, this is available. Uh, if you have the notebook, you should be able to get it. Otherwise, I will text this to you and you can download the data uh, from here. So let's see, where is the chat is somewhere here, let's check. Ah, there is the chat. I lost the chat window, so I don't know where it is, but you should um, be able to get that. I think if you go up oh, to, to the is. top and the view it. option, yeah, yeah. yeah. Here is the, okay. So you can go there and they have them into all kinds of libraries. I would stick to text file so long as uh, you can, uh, but you don't have to. So. The one more thing I want to show you that we have talked in the past and I have tried to show you the kind of data files that you can get from on your own computer. The Pandas doesn't require you to have files always on your own computer because this is a CSV that is available out there. If you want to use it, you don't have to burden your computer with downloading this file and then reusing it. And this is what we are doing. And that's one reason why I like the data. We're gonna do the pd.read CSV, and all I had to do is that I had to take that CSV, which is down here, and if you click on hover over here, you will see the text file, which is, if I can mouse, yeah. If you click on here, you will see this is the file, and there is the link. What you need to do is, you just copy this link, and if you put it here, .txt, and then if you notice this, this file, it has the tab as the separator. So what we need to tell is that to Python is that how to interpret these columns. So we have these tab separators and if you have the comma separator, you will have a comma here uh, and then give these columns names. So we call them width and length, which is what they had told. If you do this, you don't need to download this file. If you just hit that, you will be able to get that file directly taken from there and interpreted as a data frame. The one problem with this approach though is that if the file moved away and you had this notebook and you came back to this notebook in like five years, it would not be useful because your text file has moved. But if you want to just get the figure and you'd be done with it, and let's say you're trying to analyze figures that are being uploaded on the websites and you want to take multiple figures as a snapshot, you don't have to download this every time. So this approach might be helpful. So we got this data frame generated and we will, look at what the data frame is. And remember again, uh, we have the width and length. So I plot them up as from here, the width and length is an X and Y. 
I give them open circles with half the thick, the, the visibility, give them the label, always label your crops. And then at the end, you have the title and here we go. We get this. This is how the data looks like. It's a good looking data, but not straightforward linearity. Since we suspected it to be a linear equation, so again, I'm going to use that same function. And now I just, just because it's me, I'll, I'll change it to the name. So I call it a linear fit underscore SM. You can change it whatever you want to it. We will pass it the value X, A, and B. It's always a good idea to let your function know. So if you come back to this function, know what this function is doing. Uh, so if you do it with, between these three quotation marks, it tells you to define the function as what it is. And this is its description. So we get this function pass on the curve fit exactly the way we've done before. And from here, we got these slopes and plus minus. We can also get the standard deviation, as I said, uh, the standard errors, which is just the square root of these values. So you can print the standard deviation, uh, standard errors. And now we can plot this. So on that same plot, which we had done before with the half 0.4 alpha, I will overlay these hats or these predicted values that are coming from this curve fit by passing these values with this the p up as an input. So this is going to calculate them. And from there, it will generate a black line with these dotted and the label would then be linear fit. And when I run this, here is what I get. Not surprising. This data was one of the better data. Of course, you might have a data which might look terrible or you might have a data where only part of the data is linear and then you begin to have a drift off. So the choice you have, and this is where what we have done in the first class and partly in the second class, you might have to slice your data. You visually do it, see how much of it is linear and you extract that data and you fit linearity there and then leave the rest of it. And then you have a description to go that, okay, the linearity holds on until this point and then it doesn't hold. So I don't think I have to describe uh, I mean, I'm sure most of you know exactly what. But the question is, when you fit the data, now the question always is, and this is, you can visually see it from here, but then we need to evaluate the goodness of fit. And there are two ways to show this goodness of fit. One, of course, is that you can do it graphically, which is always the better one, because it's obvious what the, the goodness of fit is. But then you might also need it to show numerically, and numerically is the sum of the squares, and the R zeros and those. They have to be extracted from what we have just done. The covariance matrix helps you to do that. So the way you do it is the residual is a straightforward. That's a simple one. It's the, your true data at that point and minus the fit that you have predicted. So you will remember that in the going back to these lines here, or like actually you can look at here. Uh, the prediction is this. For this point, the prediction is down here, but the actual value is this. That's downward. Whereas in this case, say here, the prediction is telling it to be down here on the line, but the actual observation is a little up. So the simple subtraction of those numbers, those are the residuals. And you can just plot those residuals. Or you can square them. So you take the signs away. So the minus gets squared and then plus gets a square, they both lose. And from there, you can get these other fits that are part of the statistics. Um, if somebody doesn't remember them, we can go on them, but I would not, for the benefit of time, I would not necessarily. Uh, okay, David has a question. Why am I feeding it as a star and not as just as it is? What the star does is that it takes that matrix and it rips it open. So remember in this case, we have the P opt as an array of four values. It's a double matrix. It's a two rows and two columns. What the feeding the star is doing, that what putting the asterisk is doing is that it's taking that value and it's unzipping it. Um, I probably, I'll, I'll, I'll given for the benefit of time, I'll stick it here. I promise in the next class, I'll give you a small demonstration what that is. How, how is that taking that array and ripping it open and actually utilizing the values as that ripped up thing? Or I might send you, uh, David, I might send you just this uh, separately. So we got this statistic, and from there we can plot these statistics on that. And so this will generate you a residual plot where you can see, as was obvious that in the graph too, 
the linearity was pretty good early on but then after about five centimeter as they have uh, grown bigger the length necessarily doesn't hold which makes sense because they are fatter but they're not getting that much longer and that's what you see here you can see that the if you had a line at the zero the distribution is getting much more wider but what the good thing is you can tell visually that it is not getting wider at only one end if it was getting wider if it was like lines going like there and then all the residual moving on one direction you would have said that that's a bad fit in this case the fit is getting still good because the distribution of the point is roughly equal or gaussian equal above and below that line so it's still a good fit if not perfect and from there we can calculate the r squared which is this which is people always want that number that's your r square uh, and you can get the other numbers from there too let's try to fit another data which is even more unusual um i tried to find something to fit to the exponential data and i think the best exponential data would have been say a cell growth curve or a bacterial growth curve it's funny that i have done it for so many times but I didn't have an access to a data file of my own, so I couldn't do it. But then again, I was trying to act, sit with the data which is available widely instead of my proprietary or my experimental data, which may or may not, I should have a right to share. So we, I found this data on the population of the United States. And sometime when you are learning, it's important for you to have access to these data sets, which are good for practicing. So I am going to, click on this link and show you where this data comes from. This is a pretty good repository of large amount of data that some uh, gentleman had accumulated them. And from here, I am going to use the uh, US population data. This is what it is. And that's this data. It comes from the census, which I've written down here, uh, available as a CSV, and there is a doc description go with it. So I'm gonna use that data. Uh, this is the data, and there is a reference. Apparently, it was used in a map, in a book. So again, I am going to do just the same way I did last time, just because I am lazy. Uh, ideally, that may not be the best way. You might want to download the CSV, but let's say you don't do it. All you do is you just click on this CSV here, and if you hover over, you will copy link, and then you can just go down there, and you can click it here between this and if you do that that is your and now the file would break it's not the best data you can see that there is an extra unnamed line if you want to you can remove it um, and you basically the way you will do it is that since we need only the columns the year and population so all i'm going to do is that i'm going to hold on and i would have the year uh, sorry the small letter year and and if you do this you will notice that the rest of them are gone and all I have is just this if you want to just see what the head is just the pie because you don't want to clutter it you can get now remember this is has not only been extracted it has not been utilized if you wanted it to be persistent then you will have to give it a name say my df2 equal and at this point you can have the my df.2 which is the cleaner data set overwritten by the previous one but i would not bother about right now so so now we're going to plot this and you can see this that the plot is somewhat starting from 1790 in the beginning it seems some kind of an exponential population visually it looks reasonably exponential uh, but the question is has it been exponential you might ask yourself do you expect the population of an immigrant nation genuinely exponential because it's not like we have a standard set of the people seeded and they are the only one who have been coming it's an immigrant nation so there would have been waves of people coming in for certain reasons that although in our case it hasn't happened unlike italy and ireland where there are lots of people have left the country but there would be a situation for wars and famines and diseases that population would not hold and people would not continue to procreate the way they did so let's look at into that how do we do that so what we're going to do is that now I'm just for the heck of it, I'm going to extract those numbers as an n numpy array. So I extract that x data separately. So I take it as an array and I here I'm using this notation dot notation. If you remember on the first class, I talked about it. There are two ways how you can extract these columns and it's a personal choice. 
Some people like the dot notation. So if I have this as uh, my DF, you can have it either as a population, as if you call it like this, you will see that this is one way to extract the column. The other is, which is my personal favorite, um, is that you put it a square and then you dip the population and get this. Uh, either way is your choice. So, so I'm gonna take that value, my df dot year, and convert this into a numpy array. And similarly, I take this and I convert that to a numpy array. And in that case, now I don't have those indices that come with the data frame. And then I will convert the y to a log because if it's an exponential population, you will think that the natural transformation, the log transformation of that will linearize it. So the, let's see that if it does. So I take that, give it a blue color and open circles, give my labels, years, the log of the population, the title of the population, and here it is. You will notice that in the beginning, it's a pretty straight line until somewhere like here. You will notice that these time frames. this is about the civil war. So of course, there is a somewhat of a significant drop in the population because of the war years. And then starting somewhere here, this is the year 1920s, we had the Great Depression, and now going forward, the population has slowed down. It is not growing as logarithmically as it was doing in the early years of the colonial, post-colonial years and leading up to the Civil War, which is what you would know from the history. When it comes to fitting a data like this, it's obvious that it's not a standard exponential data. We cannot probably fit it to a normal exponential. So what we're gonna do, we would not be able to utilize it just like a standard curve fit data. We're gonna give it a polynomial fit. And for that, we're gonna rely the NumPy's polyfit function. So we're gonna have a curve fit, which is the NumPy dot polyfit. We feed the data, X data, the Y data, which is now in this case, we have log transformed it. And now we give it the first degree polynomial. I don't know why would you do the second degree polynomial because the more degrees you add, it gets more and more complicated to interpret it. But if you want to, you can always go to the second degree polynomial and so on. And we will fit the curve fit. This will tell you what the fit values are. And again, this is your parameter. You have the A and the B or equivalent of that. Since if you had had a third, if you had a second polynomial, let's say that you did, this will give you another third value for each one of them you will keep adding. So I'll stick with the one. We got this first order polynomial. And now what I'm gonna do is that I would feed this value back to the function, which is the exponent of this multiplied by exponent of this first multiplied by X data. And from there I plot it. So if you plot it, here it is looks. And this, as you can see, like we had visually told, in the beginning there was a good enough a match. But then afterward, of course, this match doesn't work. So this is where some of the conundrum of working with a real data set is you might have to uh, find your own data. You might have to look it into what else needs to be done. No amount of didactic training is gonna prepare you for how to handle the real data. Um, I see Steve has sent the New York Times at COVID-19 data. I looked up into it, unfortunately, while they keep talking about it's an exponential data, it's not the cell data, it's not the cell growth. There's a lot many nuances into that and it couldn't fit into the standard exponential data as it is. You had to do some massaging and you had to take some assumptions into it which were beyond the scope of the class. But it's a good data, uh, you can look it into it. It's messy data so when you import it, it's not gonna be clean two column data because they have it by the dates and they have also the date by the uh, states and year and so you need to come up with a cohesive number. But it's a fun data to work on. I, I spent a couple of hours yesterday trying to make it digestible, but I gave up. Um, since we have like five more minutes, I want to show one more important thing. And that was basically, I wanted to cover it in the last class, but it didn't got covered. When we look at the real life data, oftentimes the real life data has its own quirks. And you need to take your own assumptions and you need to do something to get the data good. So what I'm going to do is two things. I want to show you two things. One is, how do you again be even more lazier if you don't even want to download something? You, can, you have a data that you just copy paste it from somewhere. Can you get directly into a data frame? I do not recommend this method. There are lots of problems and you can see what the problem is. But let's say, this is the data. 
It comes from, this is data from Munich from some year, and uh, this is more like a test data than a real data. But what it is, is that I can do, instead of calling it from here, I can even copy paste it, and I can go directly here. And as you see here, what I have is pd.read, but now I don't have a CSV. What I have it as a clipboard. And when I have a clipboard here, I give it a header because if you look at the data, it doesn't have any header, which means that the column names are not defined. And I would have to give my own names. And what those names are gonna be, I already know upfront by looking at the data, the first column is the time or date or year or whatever you wanna call it. And the next is the temperature. So I already give it a matrix here, columns equal date temp. And then it's on my clipboard. And if I do that, I will have the data frame available. The problem is that now the clipboard is clear. If you redid it or something else, well, it's just still doing. But let's say that I copy pasted something else, it wouldn't work. So I do not recommend it, but the benefit here is that you had to do nothing. You are on your own computer. All you need is a graph. You don't care where the data is. You can very easily copy paste that CSV and get it there. You know where the data is, so you don't worry about it getting lost. But the point is, we can do this too. Make sure that when you do this, you read them. Because that sometimes your data may not come exactly the way you had wanted. Especially if there was a quirk in this data, it may not be a normal numeric value and then you will be in trouble. You won't be able to interpret it. So we did that and we can see that these are the float values. So that's good. Let's plot it. And as you plot, you see here, it's a very good sinusoidal, but then there are these sensors which must have gone berserk. Somebody would have either Smoke there, this is Munich. Somebody, maybe there, somebody, maybe some uh, scientist was too depressed and he went down and smoked around them or something. There are these unusually high, lower numbers. They're not real, of course. So, what we need to do is we need to remove those numbers which are just pure illogical. And you can choose your own logic, whatever it is. But I would think that in a Celsius, if you have a day which is above 90 degrees Celsius, that's definitely not the logical temperature. So, we're going to remove those ones. So, we convert them into array. And we take those temperature values, which are unusually high. So I apply this Boolean array on that. And then this will give you a Boolean array of true, false, true, false. And using that true, false, then I will go back to my temperature and I would actually extract the only value which is relevant. And if I do that, you will see that we get a clean looking data. So this is something I wanted to cover the last time. Sometimes the slicing and dicing becomes very important when you have a big data set and you want just some part of it to be available for you to use. Sometimes the slicing and dicing becomes useful because you have a large data set of multi countries and you want only the USA data or only the Germany data, you can extract it. Or sometimes it can be used to clean up the data if you have a right logic. So with that, I will pause. This is uh, what I had wanted to cover today. If somebody has questions, um, you can ask. Um, if somebody wants to have a question on the previous classes, I think this is also the time for that. Um, and if you have a problem that comes later, uh, which you should, if you are working on it, um, you should feel free to reach out. Sanjay, I have a question. Um, yes. I don't know if this is applicable, but I've seen uh, data sets where um, the plots are, um, they're kind of dynamic where they uh, say you start from 1995 and then the data plot goes uh, in real time to 2012. Okay. Um, is that a function that is possible on Python? To make a plot dynamic, you mean? Yes. So uh, there are, uh, the notebook allows you a lot of those functionalities. And unfortunately, I don't think we will have time to cover it, but you might have seen Tableau is a big thing and Tableau is one way, it's what we call dashboarding. Uh, in dashboarding, you have a data frame that is running on the back, but what you're doing is you're utilizing only what you need. So you can have a slider. So in this case, we are already giving a data, like plot the entire thing from 1995 to 2012 or whatever as a static. Let's say you wanted to focus only on this part, you have two options. Either you just write your script to change on the fly, or you can have a slider down here somewhere. It's, it's, there would be a little script, and the slider, you just drag it. And then when you drag it, on the real time, it is going into your data behind, 
And what it is actually doing is, I mean, what it actually would do, you can look at down here. What this would do is that you can have the X range. And so you have um, PLT dot X. And if you look at here, uh, this is the limb, right? So we can choose it to be from say 1995 to 2000 uh, here. And if I plot this, it will then extract the data only for that much. So your slider is actually just filling this value from your physical mouse input. And you can do that. You can have a screen which will then be down there or the slider would be down there and you can slice it instead of writing it every time. Uh, but we, if, if you have a special need, we can, I can look it into it and I can put it up. Unfortunately, this type of the session would not be a very good one for that. Is that what you wanted? Uh, yes, thank you. And I, I saw that Steve posted a library for yes, Dynamics. Yes. Yeah, so the, yeah, this bouquet is, one, is a good one too. Yeah. It makes, uh, you can get like an embed code so that um, you can put it in a web page. So I think some of the you know visualizations you see online where you can zoom in and zoom out and stuff use things like that. I, I've only played with it a little bit, but it's it's got a lot of different visualization types that you can choose from. Yeah, there are a lot of these it dynamic and, and they, they, it's doable depending on how much you want to go deeper into it. Um, you can have a s simple slider. Um, you can have bokeh, which is beautiful. Um, you can go Tableau route and you can take your thing in a Python and then you plot them into Tableau. Um, so we're about out of time. So if anybody has to leave, please feel free. Um, I did actually have one kind of technical question, which I don't know, maybe I should just ask you separately, but I was interested when you were defining those functions and you were showing how you could put in like a single value for X or you could put in, a, I guess it's an array. Yeah. Uh, and it will, so if it's an array, it just does them on all the things and generates an array. And this is sort of like, it reminds me of the behavior in R when you pass in vectors. But in R, if you pass in what appears to be a, a, like a, a data structure that looks like a single object, it's actually really a vector that just has one item in it. Is, mm -hmm. is that how uh, NumPy works? Does that yeah, actually consider I mean, everything an array, basically? Yeah, so in the modern iterations of Python, technically NumPy is running on the background in certain sense all the time. Um, for, so everything in Python is ultimately an array, which means if you have a single value, just one, it is, even though you entered it as a one, it is a zero index array. So what you have is one row, one column. It's just that you're not explicitly telling it to do. When it comes to the numeric computing, then you have to be more explicit about it and you need to tell that. But in the, larger, in the normal sense, that's what the pointer is. Your pointer is always leading to a vector. Um, it, so uh, it, it does it does it on its own, and that's where that that asterisk becomes important because if you try to rip it out uh, in in a defined manner, then you do that. So but yeah. it does beha it behaves kind of similarly to how, what R does then? Pretty similar, pretty similar. I think the, the there are certain advantage. I mean, there is some degree of harmony, and I think it's not so much because of the R and Python. It's because everything is derived going back from the old C and C plus plus. So. In certain sense, they are all numeric structures. They all follow very similar. Uh, Python tries to derive more of its flavors, although the C++ is what is running on the background. Uh, Python is written on the C as the, uh, as the, 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 the library is written on the C. Everything is written on C. So if you are good at that, you can actually dig deeper and you can edit your Python flies, uh, things on the fly uh, from the C. Well, thanks. Um, does anybody have any other questions bef uh, that might be of general interest um, before I turn the recording off? I actually had a question about uh, saving these figures. When I save mine, it just kind of gives a blank file. How do I get around that? Um, so you're not getting the actual file? Like you, what is being displayed is not what you're getting as a save? Correct. I'm just getting like a, a blank PNG file when I try to save it or not save Good it. Question. But, so yeah. there's a bad way to do it. Your problem, so long as you're seeing it rendered, I think you can always right click. If you see my thing, you can always right click mm -hmm. and save it as image. For a PNG, it's a straightforward. You should be able to save it. 
if it's being displayed on your thing, uh, I will have to look it into. I've never seen that problem because my understanding was that if you can lay it on here, then it should. But maybe there is something. What are you on Mac or are you on Windows? Uh, Windows. Yeah, Windows tend to have some of quirkinesses because uh, remember, unlike um, unlike Mac and the Unix, everything is not into one. So if you're running it on a notebook you're actually running it on the Kanda environment, which is not the rest of the Windows environment. So there might be something broken. Let me make a note of that and I would dig it out and I'll see, there must be uh, something on the web that somebody would have dealt with it. So uh, you... When you were a coder, I think you have to start relying on the Google search more than you have ever done. Mm -hmm. There okay. is a problem and somebody has that problem and there are solutions out there, but I'll look it into it. So did you save it in the way Sanjay did by right clicking on it or did you do something different? He's using the fig save. Uh, I'm just going, doing going off the file that you guys posted. Yeah, hmm. so if you're doing it as a fig save, uh, I think it might require uh, certain things from Windows. Um, so I'll get back to you and I'll, I made a note of it. So I'll, I'll look it into it and I'll definitely bring it on the next class. And I also have the asterisk uh, ripping versus the normal one. So I'll talk about that too. Thank There's you. another comment in the chat that it might be a browser issue. So I suppose you could try it in a different way. It's possible. Um, I would think that it's less about the browser because if it's being rendered, then it's not the browser problem. I think what is happening is that the fig save calls for the windows or whatever your operating source or resources is to then save because you have a lot more control on that. Right now, if I save it, it's going to be as good as the, win the web version is. But if you want to make a figure, you're going to tell it what the width is, what the length is, what the resolution is, and you can choose it as a PDF or you can use it as a PNG or you can use it. So there are certain resources that need to be called from. And I think what is happening is that those resources are not being made available to the Anaconda environment. So it's a, it's more like an environment issue. So I'll, I'll look it into it and hopefully I think I might have actually figured it out. I put the save fig before the show command and now it works. Oh yeah, yeah, I, I forgot. So because if you so once you showed it, then at that point the clipboard is cleared. So there's nothing to save. So it has to be before that. Okay. Yeah, that wasn't clear. Okay, cool. Thank you. Okay, great. Thanks for asking that question. Anybody have any other questions? I think everybody's good. All right. Well, thanks everybody for coming. And I feel like this has been a, a good session that gives us a lot of uh, potential things to play around with. So um, thanks again, Sanjay. And um, I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording and we'll see people next week. Then. Sure. Bye-bye. Have fun, guys. Um, stay safe and uh, post questions if you have a problem.